internship at another business school based in San Francisco that teaches out here called Presidio Graduate School. Uh, and what I do for my day job is running Fledge, which we call the Conscious Company Accelerator. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about that. So uh, if you're in Seattle, if you're at UW, right, you know Startup Hall, and there's another accelerator works at a startup hall called Techstars. Uh, the best way to start a startup, lesson number one for startups is don't come up with a new idea, take someone else's, <laughs> right? So I took the Techstar idea and I brought it over to the world of for-profit social good or mission-driven companies or, or conscious companies. Uh, and copied it wholeheartedly and told them about this and they were totally happy to see, uh, see copycats. Uh, and that's what we do. We, we, uh, we talk about the fact that we look for the best companies we can from all around the world that are mission-driven for-profits where the mission is embedded in the product or service. That's our long description of conscious companies. Uh, we invest in them, which is the Techstar model. We bring them to some city uh, and then we make them better. Uh, and we pay them to do this. Right? They don't pay us, we write them the check because we're investors. Right? And we've done this with uh, 82, com 82 companies so far uh, who themselves run in 22 different countries around the world. So this is not just a Seattle program, it's a global program. We've had, um, I lost count already, 60 something of these companies here in Seattle. Uh, and then we started replicating this in other cities. So it does run in Lima, Peru. It's right now running in Barcelona, Spain, or Catalonia, uh, depending on the week. Um, and uh, next year, it'll launch in Vancouver and University of Padua in Italy. Uh, fun fact about University of Padua in Italy, second oldest university in, the in Europe. It is so old, that's where Galileo went to school. <laughs> yeah, I love that fact. And then Lisbon just signed up. Thank you for the echo. Uh, too loud, please. Uh, Lisbon just signed up, we'll hopefully get them up and running in 2019. All right, now the reason we need accelerators, the reason all these people are coming and talk to talking to you about startups is that this doesn't happen. This is what gets written about in books and gets made into movies and whatnot. So, right, crazy bright kid uh, is sitting as a Harvard freshman and comes up with this great idea and sits in a corner and writes it. And the next thing you know, he's got you know, the 10th largest public company in the world. Right? That's happened twice, right? We can talk about that story twice. Yeah, didn't actually happen that way. That neither in the case of Facebook nor Microsoft are they in the business that that, that kid was actually doing when he was a freshman. They did something else. They, what they found was that worked for a while and then it didn't. And so they had to try something new and that worked for a while and then it didn't. And then hurdles showed up and you make this mess of forward progress and backward progress and whatnot until if you are, uh, if you're lucky, and luck is the biggest factor, you pop out the other end and everyone thinks you're an overnight success. <laughs> right? They don't see the mess, because the mess doesn't make a good story, so nobody talks about the mess. Right? But the fact is that uh, if you name a company, I will tell you what the, uh, more or less, what their plan A was. If you name a famous public company, they're not doing plan A, they're doing plan B or plan C or plan D or plan E or plan F. Because plan A's almost never work. All right, <coughs> other thing you'll hear about in the tech world is disruption. Uh, I hear about this term all the time. Uh, in my world, we don't talk about that that much, right? So this is the book that defined disruption, right? The Innovator's Dilemma. This is an older book. Uh, this is a book, anyone ever seen this book or read it? We got one, philosophy major? Took a class, all right. So this book, everyone in the room has heard the term that was invented from this book. The term is paradigm. Uh, so I love to, to quote this book because everyone uses the word paradigm and no one actually knows what it means unless you've taken the class or a philosophy major. Uh, I live with a, with a PhD from UW uh, in philosophy, so she's taught me what this means. All right, so Thomas Kuhn is a historian of science, right? Not a businessman, not actually a philosopher, he's an historian. And he was looking at how science works in reality, right? Not the scientific method that you're taught, which is kind of wrong, right? In reality, what happens is that the scientists have a bunch of beliefs on what's true. For instance, it's true, if we were 400 years ago, it's true that the Earth is the center of the universe and that everything revolves around the Earth. Aristotle said that, Plato said that, right? The Pope said that, that was true. 
And any evidence that you showed that, oh, look, the moon is, you know, that one seems to be going around, but these other things that we call the planets, they, they don't seem to be just going around. They go backwards sometimes. They seem to have some bumps on them. They're not perfect. Yeah, all that evidence is just thrown away. It's ignored because it doesn't fit the paradigm. Until one day, the paradigm shifts and absorbs all the new uh, evidence because enough evidence is piled up or because some, some idea shows up that just can't be refuted, right? So Galileo, he suffered for pushing forward that paradigm that he did not invent, right? Copernicus died before his stuff was published because he didn't want to get excommunicated. Uh, now, why do I bring this up in the world of startups? Because you really have two, well, you have three choices. You can just copy something that's already working. I already mentioned that. Or you can try and bring something forward that truly disrupts an industry, which is rare, right? So Uber, has actually disrupted the taxi industry, right? Google has brought something that's useful, but I don't know what they disrupted, right? Um, you go through the giant tech startups, most of them haven't actually disrupted anything. They've brought something brand new. They've in fact broken the paradigm. So if you go back and watch the Steve Jobs presentation in 2007 on this device that they were bringing to market, so. I actually just watched this uh, a month ago. Uh, he announced that Apple was happy to, uh, was extremely excited to be announcing three products. A touchscreen iPod, an internet, uh, sorry, a touchscreen iPod, an internet device, oh, a brand new phone, and an internet device. And he repeated that over and over again. A touchscreen iPod, right? a, uh, a brand new phone, and a breakthrough internet device. And he kept repeating it like five times until the audience started laughing and realized that he was talking about one device. <laughs> right? <coughs> and this changed the way we saw phones. Phones before this had buttons on it and small screens and keyboards and whatnot. Um, so they didn't as much disrupt the phone market as change the paradigm of what a phone is. So what do you need to know how to do in order to do a startup? Right? I'm working with tons and tons of startups between all the, all the different paths I have for uh, helping startups. It's like 100 a year that I work with. Uh, I have a theory. Uh, the theory is you have to know at least seven skills really well. And if you miss any of these skills, your odds of, of failing go up. And your odds of failing at a startup already start really high. Right, half of all new companies are dead after three years. Right, we've seen that stat, the Kaufman Foundation tracks that stat and has for years. Uh, you know, it gets worse when we talk about tech startups, 90% of venture cap capital startups don't succeed. It's actually a little higher than that. Uh, I think it's due to this. So I think that every entrepreneur needs to understand business strategy and tactics, something about design, something about marketing and sales and financial planning and accounting, uh, how to do some fundraising, how to run the company, operations. And the theory goes that if you don't know how to do all those things, then uh, you know, they're not gonna get done right. Simplest example is, uh, how many people here have had a sales job? Yeah, so less than half the hands go up. So for the rest of you, what you don't understand yet is that almost everybody says no. It's really frustrating. You know, the people who are doing sales are nodding right now. So uh, a good sales rate, a good, uh, a good percentage of sales calls that end in a sale is 10%. That means you make 10 sales calls and nine people tell you they don't want what you have. And if you're a founder of the company and you believe this is the next big disruptive uh, paradigm shifting idea, that's frustrating because they're just blind and they're just not understanding this giant vision you have in front of them. And that's a good sales rate. You know, a normal sales rate is more like five or six or seven percent. So it's like 97 people or 98 people telling you no. Sorry, 95 people telling you no, um, right out of 100. It's really frustrating, right? So if you don't know, if you don't expect that and you don't know how to deal with that, you will not make those sales. You will give up after 50 sales calls and you won't have enough customers and no, no customers, no revenue, no revenue, no company, right? Uh, but I'll go one step further, which is to say that if you don't know, if you don't understand how to do that, 
how on earth can you hire the right salesperson to sell for you? So odds are that they're going to get hired. So if you, if you do the normal path, at some point you hire a salesperson. If you follow the standard pattern of startups, you will not have the sales that you had projected. So you put down on paper in your financial model that you were going to do, let's just say, 1,000 units, and let's say you sell 800. What was the problem? Did you hire the wrong salesperson? Did you do the wrong marketing? Uh, or did everything go right and you were just wrong when you put down 1,000 in your spreadsheet? That the actual number should have been 800. You don't know. And so if, again, if you don't understand sales, it's really hard to analyze. And the same is true for everything else on that ring. So how do you know if the accountant did a good job if you don't know about accounting? How do you, if you, know, how do you know if the financial projections are good if there aren't your financial projections and so forth? And so uh, I use this. It's sitting online. It's on my website. Uh, it's free. You can download a spreadsheet and fill out your own. Uh, and this is what real people look like. They're pointy. Because the education system in this country and every other country asks you to specialize. Who here has a degree in generalization? <laughs> right? They don't offer that. Yeah, they don't even offer, I, don't, I think there's now an undergraduate degree in entrepreneurship, but the curriculum isn't these seven topics. Right? They'll push you down the business side and teach you all about business and some of these, but you know, I've never seen a class in sales in any school, any accredited school. It's just not a, a, it's not a taught topic. Uh, and I do get some pushback on this. They say, yeah, but it's all about the team, right? So wh what about the team? Maybe the team fills in all the topics. And so I've been tracking teams now. So that's an actual picture of an actual team. They each filled it out, and then we made it transparent so you can see uh, three different colors and how they cover it. And so maybe that's a reasonable uh, path forward if you're pointy. And again, almost everyone's pointy. Is find some co-founders, and between all of you, cover all the topics. Uh, what I tell my students to do and I tell my fledglings to do, fledglings are the guys in fledge, the, the guys and women in fledge, uh, is whatever you're, you're, whatever you're short on, work on that in, in the midst of the program. Right? Don't, don't, don't uh, run with the stuff you're good with. Focus on the stuff you're not good with right? and try to make it better. Uh, to teach this material, uh, in the intro you heard about this, I wrote a bunch of books. First one I wrote when I was uh, sitting as an a brand new entrepreneur in residence in this program uh, because I just kept meeting people who didn't understand like the steps needed to take your idea and turn it into a, an actual company. All right, so it's easy to come up with the idea. It's easy to come up with uh, a description of the customer, although we had trouble with that uh, a lot. Um, but all the other pieces, how do you create a financial model? The fact that you have to create a financial model. How do you create a sales plan and a marketing plan, right? Uh, there's a whole lot of steps needed, not just those seven, in order to get going. And so that book got written back in uh, 2011. Uh, and then since then, I've just been filling in the, the details of all of them by writing more books. And it's a la carte because yep, people are pointy. So if you already know marketing, I don't make you buy the 80 pages on marketing. Um, they're all thin, too. Uh, they're all on Amazon. Right, so uh, Seattle company, support, support your local, um, <laughs> your local <laughs> struggling startups. Uh, they have a great self-publishing system, so I don't have to deal with publishers. So they're all exclusively in paperback and Kindle on Amazon, uh, and uh, you can come to my website to, re to preview all the books. Uh, I also just wrote a new one. Uh, so there's now actually six, uh, eight in the series. Uh, I put down my thoughts on how to teach entrepreneurship, and it starts out with that theory of the seven topics and specifically what gets covered in each of the seven topics, and then uh, rants about business plan competitions and, uh, and other forms of startup help. And the punchline of the book is everything helps. This is helpful, hopefully. This is helpful to the audience. Uh, it's not as helpful in a given hour as some of the other programs. Right? But uh, you know, they can't all be, uh, they can all be the super high-end programs that make you do work every day for 10 weeks. All right, uh, there's also a ton of help out there. So if you're looking to, to start a startup or you're looking to help the startup you already have, uh, I just went to the internet and asked for a list of startup programs and I got this map. Just notice, it's 7,000 programs on the west coast of the US, right? Uh, and 7,000 on the east coast of the US. There is a ton of programs out there to help. So look beyond the walls of the University of Washington 
look within and then without the walls of the University of Washington. Downtown, we have a, a ton of different uh, events and programs and whatnot to help startups. Uh, just Google will find them for you. The other thing that I've found is extremely help helpful and really hard to find are mentors. And uh, I'm using the term of art mentor uh, as defined by Techstars, which is anyone who helps. Any experienced business person who's willing to give you a half hour or more of their time is what we call a mentor, right? Uh, it used to be that a mentor was someone who was willing to like have coffee with you once a month or once a quarter. Uh, we don't have a term for that. That's still a mentor too. Um, but what we do at Fledge, which is again a copy of Techstars, is that we flood our teams with mentors. We have 15 or 20 people meet with each of our entrepreneurs and then uh, something magic happens when that, hap wh when that, um, when that occurs, uh, which is that they discover that the mentors don't know more than they do. They discover that the advice they're getting when they meet 10 people on a specific topic is 10 different opinions, most of which conflict. Right? So you as the entrepreneur know your business better than anyone else. Right? Unless you're totally copying someone completely in the same market and competing with them, uh, the mentors know less than you do. Uh, and by having all these opinions, you get two things. One, you get some ideas that you wouldn't have thought of because if you get good mentors, they're, they are smart. Uh, but two, you discover that you have to make your own decision and you just have this pile of, uh, of opinions to, to work off of. Uh, the only place I've seen where you get that kind of experience with 10, 20 uh, people uh, battering with opinions is inside accelerators. So if you do the business plan competition, they'll give you a coach or two. That's helpful. If you do um, uh, the um, environmental innovation challenge or the business plan competition or the health innovation challenge, you'll get feedback from, uh, it could be 40 or 50 judges. That's helpful. Um, it's just even more helpful when you have more, more uh, face time with more people who can help. And so for those of you who are not in an accelerator, what I highly suggest you do is um, just keep at trying to get people to help you. Keep finding resources where you can ask people to have coffee with you to give you get your opinion. And keep doing that until it seems totally useless, right? which should be around s uh, somewhere between 7 and 15 of those meetings. All right, the other thing we do very differently at Fledge than any other accelerator I've seen anywhere in the world, all those 7,000 other programs and whatnot, is that we do storytelling instead of pitching. So the orange book in my series teaches people how to pitch. Uh, I do coach at business plan competitions. Uh, I, I, I teach pitching a lot. But at Fledge, we go one step further and we do story. We, turn, we don't do pitching, we do storytelling. Um, and it's working as a, as a technique. And storytelling is really about TED. Right? So I, again, I work with mission-driven for-profit companies and because they're mission-driven, and I'll tell you about a few of them in a minute, uh, they all have an interesting story to tell. Right? Sometimes it's the backstory of who they are, but mostly it's about that mission. Uh, and so we're able to put them on stage in just five minutes and have them uh, make the audience want to know more. This is one, one technique that most first-time entrepreneurs don't understand. The purpose of a pitch is to get the audience to want to know more. And if you tell them everything you can without ever pausing, speaking for your seven or 10 or 15 minutes as you're given, and just speak and speak and speak and throw all the facts you can at them, then they probably don't want to know more. <coughs> and you're done. And then the next one goes up and they do the same thing and they don't, still don't want to know more. Uh, by telling a great story, by watching how Steve Jobs did this, by watching the TED Talks, uh, you understand that all you want to do is capture their imagination, capture their heart, capture their mind, and leave them hanging and have them want to talk to you and uh, get more information. Right, if you want to see what this looks, like looks like in person, come to the Fledge website, click on uh, Demo Day. You can watch 70-something uh, uh, videos now. It's 82 because there's seven companies being incubated right now. All right, so uh, a few good stories. Uh, cotton, e so every piece of clothing ever manufactured into the, into the we history, the unforgotten history of mankind, has either been thrown away or was destined to be thrown away. 
right? We produce a trillion dollars worth of textiles into, into clothing every single year, and it all gets thrown away until now. So Evernew is a Seattle-based company that has invented a chemical process to recycle cotton. You can take all my clothes except my, uh, my shoes, toss it in a vat, melt it back down, spin it back into fiber, turn that back into fabric, cut and sew it back into, into clothing. Uh, that's a picture of the first pair of recycled jeans ever. It was manufactured by Levi's uh, coming to a store next year. Uh, here's a company, it started on Vashana Island. They dreamed of making cook stoves for, um, how to describe it? They, they dreamed of making cook stoves in Africa. Charcoal stoves to start with, biomass stoves eventually. Uh, a billion people around the planet cook on a three stone fire. A three stone fire is where you literally take three stones on the ground, put some firewood in between, or a chunk of uh, cow dung or something that burns. Start a fire, put the pot on top, and cook dinner. Uh, four million women and children die every year because that fire kills them through smoke inhalation, right? Plus a few fall on the fire, but it's mostly the smoke. Uh, this, this stove doesn't have any smoke. So they dream. That I met them at a coffee shop uh, almost six years ago. Uh, they dreamed of making these stoves on the continent of Africa, which just wasn't done at the time. They now make uh, 12,000 stoves a month. They're the biggest manufacturer in East Africa, if not the whole continent. I don't have the stats for West Africa. Uh, these two women uh, are based in Peru. They make high-end women's clothing, but all that clothing is knitted or woven by women in the uh, rural areas of Peru all made with fiber, either alpaca or pima cotton, that's grown in Peru. And then the products are shipped around the world, sold in high-end stores. So they're employing something like three or 400 women and growing um, using traditional craftsmanship uh, to make great clothing. So they're employing women who otherwise wouldn't have jobs. That one didn't come out as, as good as it should. Uh, East Africa Fruits, um, they are the largest aggregator, processor, and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables in Tanzania. The entrepreneur, when he was here in Seattle a few years ago, was 24 years old. He had saved up $6,000 of his own money to start this company, uh, bootstrapped it. He's now working with about four or 500 farmers, including some co-ops. Uh, he's still dreaming of exports. We haven't got there yet. Uh, but he has increased their average income from $600 a year, which is the norm in Tanzania. I'll say that again, $600 a year is the norm in Tanzania, to about $2,000 a year. So he has moved three or four or 500 farmers into the middle class. Doesn't sound like middle class, but it is in Tanzania. Uh, Agora Piedra Mezcal. Mezcal is to tequila what, what whiskey is to moonshine. Yeah, what whiskey is to moonshine. Right? So it's smoked, it's uh, high-end spirit. Uh, it's a traditional drink of Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, and this company is based in Mexico, and they are using, um, uh, they are employing people in Oaxaca and then exporting this product out to uh, Europe and the U.S. to bring income to the second poorest state in Mexico. Uh, Shif Labs, uh, she still teaches on the campus, I think, the founder of this company. Um, Beth Conco, yeah. She ma the Shif Labs makes this device. It's called the Drip Assist. Uh, the norm in the, in the world for figuring out how fast an IV is uh, dripping into the patient is to look at the drops and estimate. Uh, next best is to look at the drops and read off your watch how fast the drips are coming. And the very high end, there's these things called infusion pumps. So if you're in a U.S. hospital and they really need to know how, how much medicine is going into, into you, they'll hook you up to an infusion pump. The pumps cost $2,500 a piece. Um, so it's not affordable <coughs> in most of the world. So they developed this product. It's, it's less than $100. It clips onto an IV, and it counts the drops. It tells you how fast the medicine's going in. So they sell this in the U.S. They sell this in uh, developing countries, and they sell this in Kenya and, um, and Nigeria and India and elsewhere. Oh, keep going. Uh, this is Yusuf Tura. Uh, when he was a teenager, he lived, well, he's grown, born and raised in Ethiopia. When he was a teenager, we don't know how old he is, when he was a 
somewhere around teenage age, he got sent to a refugee camp in Kenya because there was an uh, outbreak of uh, communism in Ethiopia at the time. Uh, he was starving in Kenya because there was no food in this, in this camp. Uh, he spent three years of his life there. And then Church World Services in the U.S. State Department decided that he should be an American. So they picked this kid up, 16, 15 years old. They dropped him off in Olympia. Uh, he learned to read and write. He got a job driving trucks and cabs and whatnot. Uh, he said he'd never go back. 2007, he went back. Uh, his brother was still there. He got to see him for the first time in a decade. Uh, and he was just blown away by the poverty that he had forgotten about. Uh, and said, I have to do something. So he and his brother started making cook stoves, right? Just funded from the savings of a cab driver. This company used to be the largest manufacturer of cook stoves in Africa before Burn came along. Uh, that is one of the stoves. They're all handmade. They're all made out of recycled parts. Um, and they, when I found Yusuf, they had already produced 220,000 of these stoves profitably. They're the only manufacturer of handmade stoves anywhere in the world that has ever sold more than 100,000 units. Um, we actually don't know, we don't quite understand how it works and we want to replicate it. That's a, that's a challenge. Uh, all the escargot in the United States is imported in cans from Europe. We're trying to fix that. Um, <laughs> and uh, Arclight, um, there's, oh God, what's the number? 300 million tons of plastic waste produced each year only 7% get recycled. The rest go to landfills or in the oceans or dumped all over the place. If you go to the developing world, you'll see plastic, plastic and plastic bags everywhere. Uh, Arclight's based out of Argentina. They have a technique and a technology to take any plastic waste and turn it into artificial rocks. And those rocks replace the rocks we use in and under concrete. Uh, they're up and running in the market now. So that's just a little handful of the 82 companies that, that uh, I've got to work with through Fledge. Um, the one thing that I'm able to sum up with, right? sometimes I'm pressed, like, give me the secret of entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's the secret right there. It's not <laughs> very secret. It's, it's not, it doesn't sound very complicated. right? All you have to do is make something people want to buy. right? But you have to make sure that the cost of bringing that to them is higher than the than the cost, uh, uh, sorry, lower than the price they're paying. Right? They have to cover not only the price of the product. This is where people get cut off. So useful, all the underline, is not everything you think of is useful. Not everything is someone something wan wants to buy. It may be useful. They may, it may just not be useful enough to them that they'll care enough to buy it. Uh, then you have to sell it at a price that covers not only the cost of that product or service, but also the price of finding the customer and getting them to say yes. Goes back to sales, right? So if 90% of your customers are saying no, then you have, to, you have to cover the cost of talking to those nine customers that aren't buying for that one that is. And that's the part where, where a lot of uh, entrepreneurs get caught up. They forget that part. They go, well, it costs me a dollar, I'm gonna sell it for two. And then I, when they come in front of me, I go, that's nice, but it costs you $100 to find the customer. So it doesn't matter that they paid you two, you forgot about the $100 cost of finding the customer, right? Let alone the $900 cost that you lost finding nine customers that didn't say yes. All right, so I'll open it up to questions at this point. Go ahead, Ryan. So in your experience of all these 82 companies, what's the one thing you think that would be the secret to entrepreneurial success? Okay, so the question is, uh, is, th is there one thing that 82 companies could do to uh, improve their chance of success, or in general. Uh, there is no one pattern. If there was, I wouldn't have to write so many books. Um, uh, that one statement is the best I have. So the most common flaw that I see in, uh, in plans is not taking into account the, the customer acquisition cost, is the common thing, right? Um, it's just assumed by most entrepreneurs first time, never got any mentorship, that this is the best thing ever, that I have the best idea in the world, and therefore, people will see it and notice it and find it and buy it. And that rarely happens. Most, most new products are not so exciting that customers are dying to have it. Most of them, you have to talk them into it. Even if it's solving a problem they have, you still have to talk them into it, explain what it is, even if it's free. 
I've done a couple companies where the product was free, but I s we still had to like get air we had to get airplane tickets and get in front of these people and talk them into taking our product for free from them. Um, it sounds crazy, but that, that's what it uh, often comes down to. Uh, and the same flip side comes when it comes to um, raising money. So every entrepreneur I've ever met thought that they had the best idea in the world and that all these investors were just silly for not just seeing this and, and enforcing checks upon them. Yeah, that doesn't work either, right? Uh, uh, wait a second. Uh, investors, um, you know, investors have a lot of options. They see a lot of different plans. They see a lot of patterns. This is, you know, a lot of what I'm showing you here are just patterns of startups. And so when I see a pitch, I can say, well, it looked like these 10 others I've seen before, and, you know, none of those succeeded. So why should this next one succeed? Why should this 11th one succeed where the other 10 didn't? Um, and I, that's an um, incentive for me to just go on and look for the 12th one and the 13th and the 14th, because uh, maybe we'll all find a pattern that does match one that succeeded. Oh, personally. Family, okay. How do, how do you like keep it all? How do you keep it all together? Because startups traditionally have been like run. I mean, startups are high high risk, high stress environments. I mean, you're talking about getting hours, many many amount of hours from your employer and things of that nature. Yeah. I also note that that Fledge is still a startup itself, <laughs> and I didn't tell you about the other startup I'm, I'm working on. Um, personally. Oh yeah, the question is how how does how do I say stay sane with um, <laughs> with all this activity that was back on the on the bio slide? Uh, I actually only do one thing. All I do is help startups. So as of 2011, I shifted my career to help other entrepreneurs. And yeah, I have to start a company to do that, and I have to go get investors, and I have to do all the things that they have to do. But I've been doing that for uh, at that point I ha had been doing it for 20 years, and now it's been 25. So those are things I know how to do. Uh, and all I do is find ways to help entrepreneurs. And when a new one comes along, I will shuffle them either into Fledge, if it makes sense, or um, some business line competition or some other program in town, if it makes sense, or s someone else's program, because I can't help most of the entrepreneurs that come to me. Or I'll point them to a book, or I'll write a blog post uh, about them, uh, or I'll introduce them to a mentor or something. So what I've done is I've built a whole set of tools Right, uh, and, and I'm, I've embedded myself in a global ecosystem that helps startups. And so for any startup that looks sane, I can plug them somewhere into that ecosystem. And the ones that look insane, um, I, I stop writing to them after they, uh, th after they stop listening, which is, uh, which is quite often, actually. Yes? Um, do you ever consult your startups on like the name of a product after it's been consumed? For <coughs> example, two things, um, the recycling of the clothes, chemical process they use, very negative side effects for you, that process. And then another one would be plastic rocks, yeah. very negative side effects for leaching or letting toxins from those plastics into the soil. Okay, so the question is basically, are there any ne ne negative externalities to some of these companies I showed, uh, specifically the cotton recycling and, and plastics recycling? Uh, so it happens to be that the entrepreneurs I work with t tend to think through these before they come to me. Uh, so these are both uh, cradles. Well, the, the cotton recycling company is a cradle cradle company. They want their clothing once recycled to come back. It's infinitely recyclable through their process. And uh, no, their um, their process does not have any waste waste streams. Uh, in the case of the plastics recycling, uh, yeah, same thing. His environmental, uh, he studied environmentalism. That's his that's his background. The the entrepreneur is an environmental um, consultant. Uh, so no, there's no leaching out of that, that plastics. Yes, we do worry about what happens when that concrete is then uh, broken apart again. But again, it's in the concrete and then it can be made into new concrete. Right? Just like today, you can recycle concrete. So you talked about um, storytelling might have been pushing you out of playing in your own startup directly into bullet point that you started. Okay, so, so the question is about storytelling. So wh what's the keys to storytelling? Um, uh, let's see, the, the way I usually describe this is that human beings have been telling stories probably since we could talk, right, or soon after we could talk. So we don't know how long we've been, we've been talking, 
we'll just call it 100,000 years. Right? So thousands of generations, we've been telling stories to each other. We're told stories as little kids, right? What are you supposed to do with the little kids at night? You read them stories or tell them stories before they go to sleep. So we understand from an early age what a story is, and a pitch makes a terrible story. Uh, it's missing all the fun elements of the story. Right? So uh, it's missing an, an, an opening that makes you want to hear the next line. So first thing I, that I teach people when we get to the storytelling part, which is not the first thing we work on, but first thing uh, to worry about, is what's your, how, how are you going to start? You don't walk up to the, uh, actually, you, excuse me, you never stand behind the lectern if you can, if you can avoid it. Right? You've got to walk up to the audience, and you don't say, hi, my name is Looney, and today I'm going to tell you about startups. Is that interesting? Anybody want to hear the next line? Maybe. That's why you came here, but, you know. <laughs> um, it's not terribly compelling, but when I step up and I say, uh, uh, just like, oh shoot, I'm trying to get the, uh, so it's, uh, uh, African chicken solves the problem, uh, addresses the problem, no, nah. African chicken addresses the problem of poverty, hunger, and unemployment through a chicken. Which probably in most of your heads is how on earth to do that, <laughs> right? Uh, or, um, uh, try and get this one, this one right. Um, access to financial services is a fundamental human right. So we have a, a line there that sounds controversial. It's not one that you normally hear or read about, and you want to know, well, what's that mean, and how's that work? Right, so a uh, key line opener to, make to pull the audience in and make them want to know what's going on. Right? Uh, when we do our storytelling, we then usually bring in a character, because stories have characters, and we don't introduce the speaker until about a minute or two into, this, into a five-minute speech, because the speaker is the least important person in most of those stories. They're not the person, they're not the character in most of the stories. So, you know, hi, and somewhere in, in minute two, hi, uh, my name is Looney, and, and, my, and, you know, and today we solve this problem with the name of the company, and then the solution. Um, same thing, you have to have an ending, so uh, the way I, I often describe this is what happens in the pitches these days, you'll see this pattern a lot, which is, uh, let me tell you about Bob. Bob is such and such, he's got this problem, uh, we have the solution for him, and then Bob disappears from the story. Right? You get around to the financial model and whatnot, and you're not talking about Bob anymore. So how many, you know, Pixar makes good movies, yes? They tell a good story? Yeah. Um, you know, we're gonna introduce this guy named Woody, and then in act two, there's no Woody anymore. He's gone. <coughs> in act three, he doesn't show up. The end of the, mo the movie ended, and, and what happened to Woody? We saw him in act one, and he disappeared. He didn't die. He just never showed up again. Yeah, that doesn't make a good Pixar movie. They never do that to us. Nor do they introduce a new character, Woody, in act three, unless he's the bad guy, right? Um, <laughs> characters get introduced at the beginning of the story, and they stay throughout the story and have, have a character arc. Um, Kurt Vonnegut, yeah, he's got a great video out on the internet if you haven't seen it. He says there's only three stories you can tell. Stories take a bunch of different forms. There's only three that really work. Um, uh, man in Hole, Boy Meets Girl, and Cinderella. And then he diagrams them on the, on the um, uh, chalkboard, I think it was. Uh, I think only one of those works for startup stories, which is Man in Hole. Okay? <laughs> man in Hole takes a really simple form. You meet this character, usually you meet them and then they fall in a hole. And then the story is how they get out of the hole, and then you're all happy because you like this character if it's done right, and they got out of the hole. Um, uh, sometimes you start out and the person's in the hole already, and you do a little flashback to learn who it was. So starting in the middle of the story is often, is often some way to get people involved as well. Uh, and the last trick on this uh, that I'll cover, and my, I'm actually updating my my book on pitching to include all this and more, uh, is suspense. So go back, 2007, Steve Jobs, who was really good at telling stories, right, and pitching at the same time, uh, got up and said, today we're going to introduce not one, but three new products, right? A touchscreen iPod, which was important at the time. I know it sounds stupid now. A touchscreen iPod, a brand new phone, and a breakthrough internet device. Pause. He paused. He stopped. He did not speak for the next three or four se seconds. 
Right? You actually go back and watch all his presentations. One thing that makes him so compelling is that half the time he's not speaking. He says something and he stops and he lets the audience have their little aha in their head. And before they, stop, before they start thinking, because you don't want the audience thinking, uh, that's a whole other piece, <laughs> um, then he tells them the next line. Right? So what was that big piece? And then um, just to uh, fine tune this one even better, he tells this and tells it and tells it and they all fin finally get it. Okay, it's not three products, it's one device. And then he shows a picture and it's a joke. It is an iPod with a rotary telephone uh, dial on it. Um, and they all laugh. And just to be clear, they didn't get the answer yet. They're still stuck in this spot that he's built them up to and hasn't given them the answer yet. Nobody at this point knows what, what this phone is gonna look like. Uh, and he's got the, you know, the most enthusiastic audience there is for something like this. And then finally he gives them the answer and then gives them the details and whatnot. So there's all this suspense that gets built up. And that's what's missing for most of the pitches is suspense because most first time entrepreneurs that I talk to want to tell you the next fact. They don't even want to stop and take a breath. They just want to get to that next fact. Okay, does that help? Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Ooh, okay, so how can a uh, non-social good business in, in infuse some social good in the business? There's actually two, two definitions for uh, social good businesses. There's how you run your business and what the business does. So for instance, uh, in the world of, um, oh, and so for instance, there's a, um, there's a certification called a B, uh, a B Corporation. Right, so it's run out of uh, Philadelphia, the nonprofit called B Labs, and they will certify that a company is B, right? Uh, B for beneficial. Um, companies like uh, Etsy are B Corporations in Patagonia. Um, uh, divisions of giant companies like Ben and Jerry's are, are B Corporations, and then there's like 2,000 others. Uh, Fledge used to be a B Corporation. Uh, most of what they ask about your company is, uh, do you use LED lights? Do you recycle? Uh, do you have uh, mixed genders on your board and ownership? Uh, do you uh, do an energy audit every year to see how much energy you use? Um, what do you do with your community? Do you volunteer for your community? Do you give to charity? Uh, it's actually a very long list, like 200 questions. Uh, and part of the purpose of having such a long list of questions is to show companies what else they could do to be more beneficial to their workers, their, co their community, and the environment. Right? And we see this in the public markets. There's a, a system of ratings called ESG, which is uh, ESG, uh, Employee Sustainability and Governance? Environmental, Environmental Sustainability and Governance, um, uh, which some of us question, but it's still there. Uh, so that's like how you run your company. Is, is the company itself good for the world the way it's operated? And then separately, does the company have a mission? And so there we can see like the difference between um, Amazon and Whole Foods when there were two separate companies. Uh, whereas uh, Amazon was mostly focused or 99% focused on that bottom line, or at least the, actually they were focused on the top line. <laughs> right, they just wanted higher, higher revenues, they didn't care about profits. Whereas Whole Foods' mission was around bringing healthy food to, to their customers. Right? Uh, bottom line, be damned. Not damned, but you know, bottom line, less important. All right, we've got time for like two more. Yes? What advice would you give to teams that actually build a good team that succeeds? All right, so the question is, how, how do you build a good team to succeed? Uh, every team that I've ever worked with or been part of has been happenstance. Uh, it just happened to bump into each other and had same similar ideas or went to school together or uh, in one case, uh, my partner was my customer in my first company and we liked each other. And we said, we should do a company together. And we did, we did, two, we did three companies together after that. Um, uh, best way to, to uh, both help your company and help your team 
is to just get out into the ecosystem and meet a lot of people. Uh, and uh, you know, in the again, I used to be a software guy. That's not what we learned how to do when we were developers in, in school, right? And software people tend to be introverts. Uh, you gotta, you know, and back then there wasn't an ecosystem to go into. All this stuff, all those 7,000 programs did not exist when I was a first time entrepreneur. All of them didn't exist. Uh, but there are tons of programs out there and there's tons of meet and greets and meetups and whatnot. And so go out there and talk about what you're doing. No one's gonna steal it. Every entrepreneur already thinks they have the best idea. They don't want your idea. Uh, I've not once had anyone in any fledged program or any other program I've had jump ship and join someone else's team. It has not happened. Um, uh, you know, so go out, share, and s you, know, you talk about it enough and you hopefully will find a like-minded person. Startups are not easy. You know, first time startups are not doable by one person. I've seen stats, apparently that's false, apparently it has been done. Uh, it's really hard. It's a team sport. Yes? <coughs> at, at what stage would you advise the startup to go fundraising? Uh, ah, so okay, so the question is when is the right time to raise money? Um, these days, if you haven't had the guest speakers talk about the realities of funding, I have a book on that too. Um, the reality is that there are very few seed capital investors. Right? Uh, most of the investment dollars that you read about in the startup space are not for companies that are brand new with an idea or a prototype. Most of the money is for companies that have customers and revenues, which is a catch-22. How on earth do you get to customers and revenues if you don't have any money to build the product? The answer to that is go read the Lean Startup and then read it the second time, and this time stop thinking about building part of your product and start, start thinking about some of the examples of not building your product but still testing your idea. Um, and uh, what's hiding in there is the fact that you should just work for someone else and save up some money and spend your own money on the initial prototype to get to customers because all you, uh, it's really rare to find someone that who is willing to do that. If you have a product, you can do Kickstarter. It'll tell you whether you'll have customers. You can raise some of the money through that. Um, generally, you need what's called traction to raise money. Uh, and one more, one more catch-22 is the traction is, you know, is revenues would help. Customers is, is next best. Uh, other investors is really important. So if you have customers and revenues and other investors, then it becomes easier to raise money. And, but of course, how do you get the first, uh, the first investor? Uh, so what I usually tell people to do in Seattle is just go out and talk, you know, use the network, find people like me who'll do intros and find a, an angel to start it off. And don't go to an angel group until you have at least one angel already saying yes. Angel groups are really good at finishing rounds. They're not very good at starting rounds. Yeah, the world, is, this whole world is full of catch-22s. Right? Yeah. I just want to ask a question about uh, this lack of funding. So I just want to understand yeah. how you overcome culture and where the, where the focus doesn't go where it needs to start up in the different countries. Um, yeah, I get this question. So the question is, uh, how do we how does Fledge deal with um, differences in in uh, laws in, in customs in different countries? Um, we've had almost no issues with that. Um, you know, there's a couple little tweaks in Tanzania. You have to register the shares, and in Malawi, you have to register any debt. Uh, in Hong Kong, you had to register shares as well. Most of, the, most of the countries that I've dealt with so far, most of those 22 countries are either uh, former British colonies um, or simply use common law. And so the law looks pretty similar. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're starting to get to a few countries that are different. But we're just not seeing, you know, business seems to be business no matter where you go. There's, there, we haven't seen a whole lot of differences, um, it, which makes sense. Right? We have multinationals that they, I think the ma multinationals might have fixed this for us ages ago. All right, and then last one in the back. <laughs> okay, so this gentleman's friend has uh, too many ideas and is trying to narrow them down. Um, 
Well, two, two techniques. So in general, and, and even if you just have one idea, uh, the technique I, I tell people to start with is opportunity size. So go through the exercise to figure out how many potential customers are there uh, in whatever your market could be. Right? How, many could you how many could possibly use this solution, regardless of how many you could get to? Uh, and go figure that out, and then put a price, just a rough price on what you think you can charge, and that gives you a number. Then do it again from the bottom up. So given the resources you think you can muster, how many of those customers could you possibly get to in years one, two, and three? Right, so it's a bottom-up analysis of the same thing. Do that for all your ideas. See if one of them bubbles up. Uh, the other one I would do is just like put them all on, on index cards or post-it notes in front of you. Uh, take one away and say, that one, that, one, you know, that one you can't do. I'm forbidding you from doing that one. See how you feel. Right? Put it back, do it with the next one. Right? Uh, uh, someone mentioned this before. Right? So uh, uh, startups are all consuming. I don't know anyone who's ever done a successful startup and had a second job on the side. Right? They're all consuming, they will eat up your life. Uh, and I've been doing it my whole career. This is, it, it, you can survive it, but they eat up your whole life. Um, so if you're gonna do a startup, then if you have a bunch of choices in front of you, why should you do the little one? Right? Do the one that has more potential. I used to say back when I was a techie, we'll just do the bigger one, period, because if it's going to succeed, you'll succeed bigger. Now that I do socially conscious ones, I do the one that has a bigger impact on the world. So make your own judgment between balancing the, the financial gain and the, and the gain to the world. But do the one that could be bigger, however you define bigger, because they'll both take the same amount of time. They both have, uh, they'll both likely fail, right? Sorry, but they're both likely to fail. So you might as well spend the next few years of your life working on the one that could actually make a difference. Right? And the only time I would have a caveat to that is if you have a small one that's you know, the corner grocery or the corner bakery shop or the corner um, you know, pet cleaning store in a neighborhood that doesn't have one of those that's likely to succeed because we know how that business works. But probably no one in the room has one of those ideas because everybody always wants to make the new idea. Right? Uh, new ideas are more, more fascinating. New ideas for, I um, have a rant on a, a blog post on this one. Uh, you know, every investor is crazy because every investor wants the returns that you would get from opening a bakery, s a bakery in a neighborhood that doesn't have a bakery, but wants it to be innovative and new and never seen before, <laughs> right? Which is another, it's not ca quite a catch-22, it's just an oxymoron, right? All right, with that, we'll wrap it up for the day. Thank you for coming. Thanks for listening to my story. <laughs> <laughs>